We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. Do you need a car? Been shopping only to be turned down because of bad credit, low credit, no credit, bankruptcy, or divorce? Guess what? Today's your lucky day. Because now you can buy a car, truck, or SUV, just about any vehicle. It's true. Bad credit doesn't matter. No credit doesn't matter. Bankruptcy or divorce, it just doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, your job is your ticket to your new vehicle. We're Auto Credit Express, and we've helped thousands of people just like you. Antonio H. told us, great company, got me connected, and the day I went in, I drove off in the car I wanted. 100% worth your time. Need a car? Get started now and drive off as early as today. Just text FINANCE, F-I-N-A-N-C-E, to 357-911 right now to get started. That's FINANCE, F-I-N-A-N-C-E, to 357-911. Auto financing the easy way. Text FINANCE to 357-911. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty HealthShare is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. 
Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures, saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a rider's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to For Immediate Release. I'm Liz Feld, and I'm joined again by my close friend and co-host, Billy O'Reilly. Uh, we are in separate places, but um, but we're on the line together here, and we've got a very special guest tonight uh, who'll be joining us in about 10 minutes, Ken Kirsten. But welcome back, everyone. We were off last Monday for Labor Day, and we hope that you enjoyed a nice long holiday weekend. And Billy, it's good to talk to you. Hey, Liz. How are you? How's you've been, it going? You've been campaigning nonstop. Not for yourself, for everybody else. You're living. <laughs> when you have I'm, to ask I'm me the, what's new, we know it's a problem. I'm in the bubble. I'm doing the governor's race in New York, and I have no idea what's going on in the rest of the world. I mean, a little bit, but it's uh, you, you get in that bubble, and you live in the bubble, and I'll be out of it on November eighth or whatever the day is. Um, yeah. Well, it, it hardly seems like there was much of a summer. There has not been a slowdown in news. Uh, either at the at the national level, the international level, locally, certainly not with sports. Football started this weekend, so that's good. And, and I'm actually watching our New York Jets crush the Detroit Lions right now. There, there uh, hasn't been a slowdown in the political news for like six years. Doesn't it feel like that? Yeah. It's, it's incredible. I don't know. These reporters are ready to drop, I think. Some people wish they would, but, I, you know, I work with them, so I'll, I wish them well. But it's, uh, boy, I mean, it really, it just day after day after day, minute after minute. Well, and, you know, you'd think that it's just the 24-hour, you know, cable news reporters who would be on that um, pace or, or having to keep up like that. But, you know, there isn't a print reporter. There's no distinction anymore between the print and television um, that isn't following, you know, exactly the same way. It's Their deadlines are every 10 minutes. It's not every you know, 24 hours or 12 hours or three hours. 
Do you remember that when they'd say, you know, get back to me and that meant you can get back by six o'clock was, you know, was deadline. You know, it's like, you know, when do you need it? You know, d- deadline six. And now, now it's if 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 you get back seven minutes later, you're too late for the first draft of the story. You know, we'll update. We'll update. You know, amazing. Yeah. Well, I, and, and there's I mean, there's a huge downside to that, obviously. But I guess when you're looking at very bad news, there's a there's a good upside because it doesn't seem to me that there's anything that's got any traction anymore right now when it comes to uh, when it comes to break, quote unquote, breaking news. Well you, well, you can't talk about anything too long. And I think that's one thing is that uh, uh, people in politics, the elected officials, know they can get away with anything because they can endure any news cycle. I think Bill Clinton proved that with Monica Lewinsky. Eventually, the news will move on. And if you just resist it, you can survive. But it's, uh, you know, the stuff just pops up. It's the shiny objects, you know. Um, it's funny. You just reminded me on the way I was going to ask you later on the on the the, the launch music of the Apollo landing. I mean, what do you think about about them not doing the flag? Did you see that story, Liz? You well, sent it to me. I did you send it, it to you. Me, I, I did send it to you. And I saw, <laughs> I actually thought Are it was a mistake. Me? I actually thought it was a mistake when I first read it. And then I, and then I almost, I, first of all, I was disgusted. And then I laughed and I thought this is, it's not even political correctness. I don't know what it is. The fact that the, um, that the, uh, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, um, there's a new movie coming out uh, with Neil Armstrong and the first moon landing, uh, you know, with the Americans planting the flag. Uh, and that particular clip where the flag is actually planted has been deliberately omitted from the film. Bradley Cooper is the star. He plays Neil Armstrong. And uh, he, because it, it, they think that this was actually an international moment, which it was. It was certainly celebrated. Oh, it, world. <laughs> but as Marco Rubio pointed out, American money, American ingenuity, American technology, and American initiative. And we're actually a right, an American president that. calling it, yeah. you know, yeah. right. We're actually hiding it. Let's do everything but show the American flag. It's 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 just nuts. It's just nuts. You know what kills me is I'd love to see that movie, but I can't see it now. I refuse to watch it if they're going to omit the American flag from that. You know, I wonder if if somebody like space, like they just forgot to 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 do the flag scene, and now they're trying to rationalize yeah. it. Yeah. You, know, you know what I mean? Because like, what are you well, kidding me? I actually thought, you know, what would be better than sitting in a Hollywood movie script script meeting and um. And hearing, you know, flying the wall and hearing the, the 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 back and forth about it. Well, we could, but we don't have to. I just the whole thing, like people you get some crazy you know, liberal. Well, this is really an international thing. Carried right. all the way up there, but it just you know, should be, no. It's it's really a, it's just nuts. I'm surprised Trump hasn't waited on that actually, or maybe he has, and I just missed it. It was probably the twi- same 28 year old who wants to prosecute the U.S. for war crimes in Dresden or something. You know, it's you know, it, it just uh, come. I mean, come on, get real, get real. Yeah. I, um, but you know what's going to I'm sure the movie's going to kill it now. And they'll probably make more money than anything else, given what the mood of the country is. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. Um, Lee yeah, Ryan, it's tough. It's tough. We're going to talk about what's going on with Nike and their uh, spectacularly um, popular campaign supporting athletes, which obviously stemmed initially from um, Colin Kaepernick's um, protest of um, the national anthem or during the national anthem it wasn't of the national anthem during the football games and what it's led to. But um, I, I don't know how you feel. I like reached Ken Kirsten. Please leave me a message. Thank you. Well, that didn't hey, work. Ken. On the tone, please record your message. <laughs> when you finished recording, you may hang up or press one for more options. Hey, Ken, it's Bill O'Reilly and Liz Fell. We're just calling to wish you a happy new year. Um, <laughs> we're, we're on the show now. If you got a chance, uh, give us a shout. The audience would love to hear from you because you're brilliant and um, and you know you know a lot. <laughs> He's answering. I think he was expecting the call to come from me. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, uh, so um, so what do you think about the Nike stuff? Oh, I was gonna say we should we should probably introduce Ken before he calls back in. You know the the Nike thing though. Um, I actually think it might be a brilliant move, and the reason is um, is that. Uh, I think Nike's thinking a couple of steps ahead that the athletes and particularly the the black athletes, African-American athletes um, will, you know, Nike's hot again. I mean, you got to stay cutting edge. They will wear Nike's again. And what do the kids wear, but what the athletes wear. And so, uh, you know, I had my, my sister work for a bunch of years studying um, for a book um, uh, trends in, in um, African-American communities because the, the the kids in the suburbs, the white kids in the suburbs, would pick it up about 18 months later. 
So it's like th- that's I mean the, the trend starts someplace, and with athletes, it starts in the field. Not that all athletes are black, but a lot of 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 great athletes are. And um and and I think um black and white athletes will be wearing Nikes because Nike Nike came out and and did what it did. And in the end, I think it's a smart move. Short short term it may hurt, but lo- long term. Uh great. Sorry about that. That was just Ken trying to dial and start. We're having another one of these little issues. Hold on one sec. Okay. Okay. Um, hey, Rick. Yeah, I'm here. Tell yeah. Him. Uh, do you need his number again? So he's been trying to. He's been trying to dial you too. No, I have it. It's just this. This account won't actually dial in. Just tell him to hang up, and I'll call right back. Okay. That's okay. Just so you guys, everybody knows, is uh, Ken Kirsten's going to be joining us. Ken is a, is a uh, absolutely fascinating guy. He, um, uh, besides being the uh, former editor in chief of the New York Observer, which was um, Jared Kushner's newspaper. Hello. Oh, here's Ken. He can talk for himself. Hey, Ken. Hey, Ken. Welcome. <laughs> Sorry about that. How are you? I'm great, guys. Happy New Year to you. Like old no, times. All of our Happy New Year. It's like old times. Celebrating the holiday Thank tonight. You. Happy New Year to you, you both and all your listeners. Billy was just giving oh, you thanks. an illustrious introduction, so I'll, I'll let him continue. I was. I was just boasting about all the things you've done. You've done so many interesting things. Um, and I'm trying to think what the best way to introduce you to our guests. One thing we thought about, Ken... Um, be, because it's germane, uh, t- you know, tomorrow in particular, um, is, is, you know, th- with the nine 11 holiday, not to talk about nine 11, you know, too much. Um, but you are the author the co-author with Rudy Giuliani of leadership, which I believe was published in 2002. Is that right, Ken? And we, th- uh, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, very late 2002, the fall. Two, 2002. And I was wondering, it might be really interesting. Could you talk a little bit? about what it was like working with the mayor for, uh, in preparing the book. I mean, those are some pretty heady times and you, and it was captured beautifully. Uh, you and the mayor certainly, you know, captured it cause you lived it. Well, I really appreciate that question. And I was just actually thinking tonight, uh, you know, we had family dinner for the holiday and I was thinking how, um, you know, it, it, it Monday, September 10th, 2001. Um, now, you know, we're back on a Monday, September 10th. And uh, going into Tuesday, September 11th, and September 10th, uh, 2001, was really the last day anyone anywhere near New York and, and to some some degree Washington ever went to sleep uh, without sort of understanding what the what the world was going to be like. So uh, I had been working with Mayor Giuliani for about eight or nine months at that point um, on a on a book that was at that time supposed to be the sort of, you know, cute little management book. It was going to be called Rudy's rules. And it was about, you know, how mm. you take an out of control city and, you know, fix crime, fix the budget, all the, all the stuff he had done. Uh, he, you know, he had had a, a great time as mayor, um, for seven plus years at, the, at that point, but, uh, he wasn't that well known to the, the rest of the country and certainly the world. And then all of a sudden, in you know, by a span of 15 minutes or so, uh, the entire world changed and, and Rudy was right at the center of it. And, uh, you know, I mean, he's on TV all the now, all the time now defending Donald Trump and he ran for president. I was involved with that. And you can think whatever you like about, uh, about what Rudy's done since, but it's, it's very hard to, to look back on that time, um, 17 years ago and, and not just really be grateful for what this man did for, for this city and this country. Um, in standing up so strong uh, as he did. So it was the most exciting thing uh, that could possibly happen in an author's life. You know, I, I, I just, I, I don't really, uh, I've, I, you know, I've done pretty well for myself. That book was a number one bestseller. I've written a bunch of others. So I've, I've done pretty well writing words, including with both of you guys. And it's still, this, this many years later, uh, it's hard for me to put into words what, what it felt like to be the, the sort of official chronicler of uh, Rudy Giuliani during that time when the entire world's eyes were on him. And Ken, it, did you did you um, keep uh, a, a moment to moment journal that diary that day, or over the course of those couple of weeks after that, or did or did the mayor, or how did that all work? I, I did, Liz. He wanted me by his side as much as possible for that very reason, because things were happening so fast that he wanted uh, for for posterity and also for his own, you know, decision making to have someone. Uh, writing down whether it was you know uh, helmet coal coming to see the site or um, 
you know, uh, the sudden appearance of, of what looked to be packages of anthrax in Tony Carbonetti's office. You know, it was yeah, yeah. an incredibly chaotic time. I don't know if, if you guys or your listeners would even remember, but just about a month and a half after 9-11, a giant plane on its way to the Dominican Republic crashed right after leaving JFK. It didn't just crash. It, it crashed like on the streets of, of Queens. Uh, yes, you know, I, right. I remember going there with, with the mayor and seeing this giant engine uh, on, you know, on the streets. Um, and it, it certainly seemed like that was going to be terrorism. We had, we'd had anthrax. We'd had September 11th. So that, that turned out not to be. There was some kind of tragic mechanical failure. But it just, if you remember those first couple months after the attacks, it just felt like this, this, is, this is war. It's on our soil. We're, we're under constant attack. Ken, you, uh, you just said something that was that was jarring to me. And, and first of all, I think leadership will be, I, I think, the the chronicle for the rest of time. I mean, that that book is is now a, a, a history book, and that's quite something. But when you said September 10th, it reminded me I was at the I was running the Metropolitan Republican Club up on 83rd Street. We did a rally for Mike Bloomberg. I had forgotten about the night before, and we got out there, went to bed. We had the primaries the next day. And the whole world changed after that. It was never the same. But you you also were, I mean, in so many ways. I mean, it brought us to where we are through the Bush era, the Obama era. Like, it it literally changed everything economically, uh, sociologically. Um, but going back to, the, to that Giuliani that, that we all remember so well, um, it, w- what I found extraordinary was the little things that he did that I, I don't know if the rest of the country knew about. Because, um, you know, there was other news by that time, but he was out and you were probably with him, Ken. He was out serving as like best man for widows, for 9-11 widows. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was going, he, he officiated those funerals. Like, can you talk to that a little bit? Those little things that a lot of the public didn't see. Yeah, well, thank you for, for drawing attention to that, though, because I, I, I think it's important um, because I, you know, I think that's the role of a of a public official is, in, you know, when tragedy happens, you you become kind of uh, comforter in chief. And, you know, Rudy was a strange guy to work for because if things were going really well, um, then the tiniest little thing could, you know, could make him really uh, crazy, you know, really upset. But it, but under the worst duress imaginable, there was nobody calmer and more steady uh, at the wheel. Um, so uh, you described it well, and I, I picked out one particular day um, because I just want to show the totality of it. He, you know, he attended some 300 plus funerals, and remember there was yes. there was over 300 uh, just firefighters who died. Um, so uh, you know, you literally couldn't go to every, everyone's funeral because there were off, there were so many people killed. They were at the same time um, in different parts of the area. But he he went to over 300 funerals, and I picked out one day. I think it was around Columbus Day. So maybe early October, I don't have the, the book in front of me. And it just detailed what it was like to go to the, you know, funeral after funeral where the grandparents were there. You know, it's, it's just, it's so upsetting and jarring. And by that point I had been with him at a couple of funerals when, you know, an officer had died or some you know, in the line of duty or there, I think there had been a firefighter who, got, who uh, unfortunately got killed in a fire. So, you know, I understood it to be a, a, a sad thing that can happen, but the, the totality of it, when you're going to 10 or 11 of them in a day, you, you literally have to chopper across the city um, and uh, and just at the same time when everyone there is, is also shell-shocked, not from losing the loved one, but from this, you know, this fear that the, the city and the, and the country were under siege. It really was a, an amazing time. And I, I think Rudy um, handled himself with, with such incredible dignity and uh, strength it, it just set an example for the world. And I, I'm not trying to make a political statement. I, I realize there are people on all kinds of uh, partisan views. It's not my interest to, to try and persuade them, you know, to support Rudy's politics or anyone else's, although obviously I did um, and do. But um, I think on that, on that, you know, time, early October in September 2001, was about as close as this country could get to real unity when we really believed in, in uh, what this guy was doing, and by the way, there were there were uh, politicians on on all sides who who just stood up incredibly strong and uh, behaved themselves. And I think about that a lot now in these incredibly divisive times when everybody just seems to, you know, to hate each other. 
Yeah, and it yeah. seemed to last, for, and it lasted quite a while. It was not a, a fleeting, you know, feel good moment for the, you know, for, for people, you know, from all walks of life and all sides of the aisle and, you know, across the country. It, it, I, I think for years that there was a the tremendous uh, strength and goodwill that came from all of that, that really from that leadership. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. It really shows you the reason we changed the name of the book from, you know, this cutesy sort of Rudy's rules to just plain leadership is because it matters. And, uh, you know, Rudy would get asked uh, constantly. We did, you know, three, four years of speaking to her after this. So he could, you know, meet audiences all over the country and all over the world. He'd get asked constantly, are, are leaders born or made? And uh, he had a really nuanced answer. He, you know, he would say, well, first they have to be born. <laughs> but after that, you know, they, they've, they've got to really study um, the things that that motivate people. And we talk about things like like optimism and how you just don't want to follow, you know follow someone into battle if they're not if they're not confident. Um, and he, and one of the points he'd make that it seems so elemental. In fact, I, I remember trying to talk him out of including it in his in his stump speech. But I'm really glad uh, I couldn't talk him out of it. Is he used to talk about and and he was, he'd always end it with his final point. He'd say um, if you want to be a leader, you've got to like people. And that seemed like uh, axiomatic to me, like like a tautology. But I I understand now that there was a much deeper layer that he meant. He he meant that you you have to like people in a way that doesn't think that you're better than them. You just have to sort of like being around people, and that and the people who want to be led can feel that. And I think that that's what what people mean when they talk about you know uh, that sort of you know the three of us have been politics together. You know that com- the constant question you get: How how could George W. Bush have beaten Al Gore or Bill Clinton? You know, have beaten a uh, uh, very popular than uh, George H. W. Bush. And they ask that question: Who would you rather have a beer with? And that's really what that's getting at. Um, and it's a meaningful question because of that. So it's, you know, you got to like people. Uh, that's right. Can I got to say one thing? I I don't think I got a chance to say it to you when you were. Um, editor at the Observer was I, I was such an admirer, and, and and you know I probably I'm not always the the biggest fan of of uh, of the president, but you know I, I I try and call balls and strikes. But I noticed that that as editor of the Observer, I mean owned by Jared Kushner, you would run stuff that w- that was sometimes critical. Like I I thought I was almost breathtaking by it by how down the middle I thought the paper ran things, and um, well, to me it was that, it was though. the way journalism is supposed to be. Yeah, it, you know, it was so I, striking I to me. I, like, I was amazed by it. I, I always felt like uh, the paper never got enough credit for that. And quite frankly, I felt like I, I still feel like Jared Kushner never got enough credit for that because he obviously he could have fired me. He could have fired everybody there. He should get huge um, credit. I, I he think get it's, huge credit. it's he really should. And, uh, you know, we 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 ran um, a story by uh, Dana Schwartz, who was a staffer there, who who wrote an absolutely brilliant and brutal take on what she she believed was uh, uh, well then candidate Trump's failure to address anti-Semitism among some of his supporters. We ran uh, unbelievable commentary. We broke news. We we broke the story. This is a classic Bill O'Reilly type story. We broke the story that, that one of the I think Trump's uh, New York State chairman. Um, had had been uh, either sent a mail or been quoted, you know, saying that Barack Obama was a Muslim, which is very unpopular, and um, you know, it's a tough story. And we broke that story. So, I, you know, we ran a lot of stuff, not not just commentary, but breaking news. But what we didn't do is completely dismiss him. There were, you know, there were places like the Huffington Post that would only run stories in the entertainment section, or places right. that would run these silly disclaimers saying, you know, we don't cover him seriously because he's a, he's a a TV reality person. We we made the assessment, um, partly because of my you know tenure in politics, that this was a serious candidate who had a really good chance of winning the primary and uh, you know a decent chance of being competitive in the general, which you know turned out to be right. So we took the candidacy seriously uh, from the beginning. We we covered him tough, and uh, it was a tough position because his son-in-law was helping to run the campaign. There's no doubt about it. That was a very tough position. I don't know that we got everything right, but we, we really did try hard to to, uh, to be fair. Um, can can I, I ask I, you? I, yeah, oh, sorry, Billy. Go ahead. Go, Liz, go ahead. I, you know, I just want to ask you, um, given your your experience and your credentials as a, as a journalist and a first-rate journalist. Um, if you could share your thoughts on the anonymous or the anonymity of the New York Times op-ed and just not, never mind the contents of it, but just 
um, whether the Times should have published it the way it was submitted, what the responsibility is of the paper, uh, do you give it any credence given that it was anonymous and that the average viewer has no idea what a senior or what level a senior administration official really is, um, and all of the above. Well, from the, from a journalism point of view, I, I think there's absolutely no problem with the Times running it. I would run it as well, um, presuming that it is, as they said, you know, the the person's identity is known to them, and and they said that, and I believe it. Um, so, you know, if it just came in through the transom as anonymous, and the person said they were a senior official, then then they shouldn't have run it. But they said they know who it is and that it, it is as described, I think journalistically there's absolutely no problem with running it. But I, I'm, I'm going to weigh in here and say that as for the person who ran it, I, I, I think it's, it's despicable behavior. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm just someone who thinks you, you sign your name to, to what you think. And um, if, you're not, if you're not okay with, you know, nobody likes every decision their, their boss makes. That's, that's what it means to have a job. But if you're so uh, discontent with, with the direction that the the leader is taking the enterprise, you leave the enterprise and fight from the outside. That's that's more true in the democracy than anywhere because this doesn't reflect some you know some uh, guy who became president through a coup. Uh, people you know he was elected fair and square through you know through the rules of of our system, and you know you can talk about three million fewer popular votes or whatever asterisks you want to put, but he what won. I think that he people won. Yeah, he won. He won. And what I don't yeah. think people are correctly uh, assessing is that the people who are are who hate Trump so much that they're cheering this, um, they're giving permission for the next hundred presidents to have uh, similar um, That's treacherous right, behavior in their midst. He, and, and it's I came around dangerous. to your opinion pretty quickly. Yeah, no, that that's right, Ken. You're setting precedent, and that's um. And if I was working, I've worked for a lot of candidates over the years. That would be. You know, I don't mean you know by law, but it feels treasonous to do that. You just don't do that if you can't take the candidate. You walk away, and you, and you say you why. Know, that's I'd why love to I ask you. And I, and I, is that right? That's why I left politics, Billy. I I, I had a candidate. Uh, you know, I, I don't. There's no need to embarrass this person, but I had a candidate in 2010 who was was so outrageous, uh, and I really didn't think this person could win. Um, right. So you know you have sort of a, a duty, almost like a, you know any, any vendor of legal. <laughs> you have a duty to work hard, and then in the Tea Party wave, this this person won, um, and it's a prominent office that they won. And I I just did not, it just didn't sit well with me. And then over the the intervening next few years, um, my my sort of bad feeling was was proven right, and I I just I just. You know, you don't always get to work for a, a Liz Feld, right? You know, sometimes you got to hold your nose a little bit, and um, that's that's really the reason I, I took the observer job. Is I, I just couldn't stand the thought that I was helping to put people into real positions of power. So you know, it's not a game. It's uh, it's not like it's you not know, a game. You're helping yeah. the Yankees win instead of the Red Sox, where you know ultimately it doesn't matter. This is. This is important Can, stuff, and uh, Ken, and I know we, we won't keep you too long because I know I know it's um it's the it's the new year, um, but I'd love to talk to you and Liz and I talked talk, talked about it in advance that we'd love to get your take on where politics is today, which is one of the reasons why I've tried to get out a couple of times. I keep ending up back in, in part because I need to make a living. But wh where do you see it compared to where it was, you know, in two thousand? I mean, it's a completely different game. I'd love to get your take. It's totally unprecedented. The, the, uh, Trump has completely shifted the rules. It is really not about left and right, which was the dynamic that all of us, uh, you know, came up in. It's now t completely about uh, insiders and outsiders. So, you know, the the insiders of both parties cannot stomach this guy, and they're strong and they have a lot of power. So, you know, you've got the entirety of the media, the entirety of Washington, uh, you know, whoever wrote that editorial, Bob Woodward. That's right. the inside, and they they hate him. And then outsiders, again, from both parties, uh, like this guy. And that's, it's, a, it's a very strange dynamic. That's, that's never happened during the lifetime of anyone on this call. Um, so unfortunately, that, that dynamic has been accompanied by a nastiness that's just, uh, and part of it's enabled by technology, and we've got Twitter and these other sort of really just dangerous uh, People have the ability to, you know, broadcast their opinions to, to millions instead of just to, you know, the people on their their corner bar. Um, so our, our politics is in a really uh, uh, sick, 
state right now, and it, it's very discouraging to me. Do you feel, you know, I, I agree with, I share everything you just said, Ken, and do, do you think, um, though, that something's starting to shift here, even with Trump's supporters? Billy and I were talking earlier about how he's sliding with independence, even, and I don't know if it's the cumulative effect of um, the books that are being written, these nutty people like Amorosa with her tapes and her, uh, um, you know, again, people who exit the exit the White House and feel com- compelled to go out and tell every single detail that, you know, that went on every day. I don't know how much of it is even accurate. Um, certainly the way the president and the White House handled the McCain death and funeral was, I thought was unfortunate. I, I don't know why they did it that way. But um, just cumulatively, if you think uh, we're starting to see some real effects on, on the president. Yeah, I absolutely do think that. I, I think it's it's hurting him a lot. You know, you know, I think that the, the Democrats and others who oppose Trump tried for about a year and a half to make Russia the story. And that, that just didn't didn't stick at all because it's not a mm-hmm. first of all it relies on you know a smoking gun and um you know absent a smoking gun it it doesn't it it it, it makes it feel like wow we just wasted you know 2000 hours of tv time uh you know because there was some meeting with some low level <laughs> staffers so right. it it didn't it didn't make any sense at all but when you start to say okay forget about russia the real problem with this president is you know his administration's in total chaos and then every day it's like, uh, you know, there's some new chaotic uh, incident that happens. It, I think it does have a cumulative effect. And I don't think that that's necessarily the, the president's fault, um, but it's certainly his responsibility. And, um, he, you know, if, if I were his advisor, um, I would, you know, I would advise him that, that this is a big deal. And, and you got to you got to it's not enough to actually have put in place a lot of policies that are moving this country's goals forward, which I think he has. You have to, you have the job as communicator in chief to, to let people understand that, that you've done that. Um, and when you're talking about Omarosa and you're talking about John McCain's funeral and you're talking about, you know, countless other things, you're not communicating that, well, you know, black unemployment is at uh, the record low in, in history and that the unemployment rate uh, in general, is lower than the GDP, which I, I never thought I'd say in my lifetime, and that we tore up the Iran agreement and we moved the the embassy to, uh, Jerusalem, in Israel, right. to Jerusalem, and all of these other promises that were hard to do and were fulfilled, and are uh, you know, if not universally lauded, like I think the first couple of things I said, at least uh, appreciated by the people who originally supported him. I think you know, if you're talking about Amoroso, you're not talking about the unemployment rate and. Uh, it's it's just it's that simple. That that's right. You know, I just saw Jason Miller make a, a similar observation on on television earlier. But that's right. I mean, we all we talked about it. I, mean, I sat in how many meetings with you, Ken, on campaigns talking about message discipline, and it's uh, he's. I mean, the, uh, the economic side, he's got a great conversation to have. He should be pounding it every minute of every day, and it's you know it's hard. It's hard when you know. Um, you know I mean, some people think very quickly and they get distracted easily. But it's um you know it could be it could be death in a communications environment that chases every shiny object. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, th- I think the one thing that will help this president is the the sudden reemergence of Barack Obama. I <laughs> and John Kerry and John why. Kerry. Me too. And John Kerry. I agree. And Hillary Clinton. You know, she's on the bridge with with uh, Governor Cuomo. I I just think that that Trump is a guy. He's a counterpuncher, and he's a he's a guy who really needs. Uh, Okay, here's what I'm like, and here's what the the other guys like. He he just needs that to articulate his his message. Do you um do you think there should be any uh, hard and fast rule or or, or, uh, or policy about uh, ex employees or former employees of the White House going out and writing books? Whether there should be a five year waiting period or a ten year waiting period or no ban at all or. Um, because uh, I, I happen to think that every president or any president is, should be entitled to some uh, sense of security uh, and confidentiality. And that doesn't mean that things shouldn't be transparent, and I believe fully in open government. But um, this seems to me, and, I, I, and this really started with George Stephanopoulos writing a book after the, right when he walked out of the Clinton White House. But it seems to me now that people almost go in with the full intent of writing a book within two years and getting out. It's, it's just yeah. baffles me. No, I, you're 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 bringing up some valid points, Liz, but I, I can't agree with you. I, I, I'm a you know a First Amendment absolutist, and I, I I'm not a you know as a book author, I'm not about discouraging people from writing books. 
what, what I think uh, is the much better solution than some kind of ban or asking them to sign these non-disclosures is, uh, you know, hiring people of character so they don't, uh, so they don't, you know, get kicked out and two seconds later have an instant book with some secretly recorded stuff. I mean, you know, w- why do you have people working for you in the White House for secretly recording? Well, no that's, question. That's the, no question. Of course, that's, that's the, the question. Yeah, yeah. There's no question about that. Right. So, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I think that, that the, the, this president became president because he hadn't been involved in politics for 40 years. Like, you know, this this uh, murderer's role of Republican candidates he, who he, he bested in the primary and certainly like his opponent in the general. But one of the one of the downsides of that. Is you, you know you you promise yourself you promise your your constituents you're going to be a, a a change candidate and do everything differently, so then when you become president you you hire people who are sort of you know not the usual suspects and that gets you some good change fast and they're not scared to break things but it also gets you some some uh, people who are you know basically reality show contestants and tape you behind your back and then write a book. Yeah. Yep. And Ken, before we lose you, what, what what are you working on now? You're always doing. I know you had a you had you were in the music industry at one point. You've been an author. You've been a editor. You've been a, a political ad maker. Um, you, you've been a political advisor. Uh, what are you up to? I just love to hear. Um, before we lose you, what, a, what you're doing? A polite a polite way of saying I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, so uh, yeah, <laughs> no, you're website. always you're always doing that's about 19 true. things. You're He's got a couple of websites, six or seven. Yeah, that's right. I I, I started um, I started this suite of sites uh, mostly under a brand called the Globe. So the New Jersey Globe, which is uh, the leading political news site in New Jersey, uh, the California Globe, which is uh, new but growing, the Rock and Roll Globe, uh, Book and Film Globe, um, and then there's one that's also about cryptocurrency called Modern Consensus. Um, so so that's what I'm working on. And, we probably got two more that are going to come online later this year, uh, and then we got to take about a year to digest them, and, you know, get them going like they should. But so far, oh, they're, they're, uh, that... they're growing. They're growing fast and getting readers. Ken, is Did there you... anyone on the political horizon who could drag you back into uh, into the into the mix? Do you see any young folks around the country at all at any level? Who, who you think? You know, other than Liz, it's really hard for me to picture Liz. I said young I, I folks. Did... <laughs> oh, what, I, I didn't hear the, the suggestion. Um, I, it's hard for me to picture. I, I did, uh, you might recall, because I, I, I got a lot of guff for it. Um, I, I, I did a little bit of writing for uh, the candidate when, when he was candidate over, um, you know, he, he had the speech to APAC that I, that I helped on. And um, I've done some stuff like that since, uh, you know, I'm no longer in, in um, the owner of a newspaper. So, uh, it wasn't as controversial, but I, you know, I've helped Jared on some things. Um, but it's very tough for me to picture myself working full time uh, for candidate at this point, um, because it's partly because of the grind. You know, it's it, it wrecked my marriage, it wrecked my, you know, wrecked my finances. It wrecks a lot um, of marriages. Tough yeah. work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but but secondly, because you know, I'm in a good place now. I'm thank God I'm married to a new person and trying to trying to be a you know, full-time dad and a full-time stepdad. So it's, it's just, uh, you know, for personal reasons, but you know, it's like Godfather three when, you know, just when you think you're out, they pull you back in. So who knows? <laughs> it sounds like you've got your hands full. <laughs> doing the, doing yeah. what you should be doing yeah. and having a good well, time. So. Yes. Well, can I gotta, we- I gotta uh, come up to, I gotta come up to Mimarinek and uh, see you guys at sales sometime. Yes, oh, it's you a deal. Do. Yes, oh, that you sounds do. Great. We we promised we let you go. We know you know we you're with your family and you're celebrating Rosh Hashanah. But Ken, th- thank you so much for being on there. You could you could you could talk for hours. I'd love to listen to everything. Hopefully you can come back on because we'd love to have you again. Well, thank you for that offer. You're two of my favorite people in uh, New York politics. I always love working with you both. Well, and Ken, it's so um, uh, uh, fortuitous or um, it's it's good karma that we have you on the night before September 11th. You were such a big part of that day. So yeah. we'll be Thank thinking you of you tomorrow. And remembering. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Talk be to you well. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Thanks, Ken. Thanks. You know, Liz, I was just thinking about it. It, it was, uh, I was just thinking about the, the Giuliani of those days. He was also serving. He was, uh, I remember he was um, serving as the father of the bride for a number of those uh, weddings after 9-11 where the fathers were killed. 
Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd forgotten some, I'd forgotten those moments. You just kind of shut them down at some point, but he really was extraordinary. And Ken, Ken was there along with him for every, every minute and capturing it all for leadership. Pretty, and I pretty amazing. See- <laughs> Excuse me. I remember seeing him at so many police, um, officers funerals with the little kids you know so many of those officers who died were young you know they're probably 30 you know early 30s and they were these little a lot of these widows had were either expecting babies or um had you know two-year-olds or infants and uh he the mayor was there for so many of those funerals too yeah and he did it for yeah, a I mean, long isn't time. just amazing how much how much the world is different between now and then it's just crazy it's just crazy I mean, yeah. with the you know, we went all over the world with with some pretty expensive wars, and you know, then the the, the economy tanked. Uh, um, you know, um, you know, the the political turmoil followed the wars and the and the economy tanking. We started swinging, you know, back and forth, left, right, left, right. Um, just a a, a really uh, incredible confluence of events to get us to where we are right now. You know, pr- pretty interesting. Well, you know, it's also interesting to think that a lot of the kids who are you know, in high school now, obviously, they don't remember 9-11, um, but they also don't even really know what their, you know, the universe, their their universe was like before this, you know, age of terrorism. So it's the for any time they see anything on the news, their first assumption is, oh, oh, those terrorists, you know, um, oh, it was a terrorist attack. And even if it's someone getting mowed down in Times Square, you know, the first thing people right. think of now, it's, 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 it's staggering. You and I never had that experience, you know, 20 we were years. hiding. We were hiding under the desks from the Russians, you know. <laughs> yes, we didn't even know why we were hiding. They just said it's an air raid drill. We thought we were hiding from our parents. Right, we we didn't know why we were hiding. I yeah. thought it was the Japanese coming back. I had watched too many Pappy Boyington movies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so true. You know, one of the things I wanted to talk to Ken about, but I had promised him um, that we wouldn't keep him too long. Um, was what he thinks about Ben Sass. And I don't, Billy, I don't know if you've been um, following him, but he was on TV all of uh, this whole weekend, wall to wall, because uh, he was kind of baited into talking about whether he would ever leave the Republican Party. And he said that he had thought about it quite a bit. And he, he meant leaving it for the conservative party. He didn't mean leaving it to become a Democrat. But, um, uh, you know, he's been very vocal over the last couple of years. He wrote a terrific book. Um, it's part biography, part, you know, his view, worldview of uh, of what uh, sort of what it takes to raise um, to raise get a solid citizens and what, you know, you know, the morality of this country and what, and what we need for the future. Um, so I don't know if you like him or if you've watched him, but I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah. I, I really like Ben Sass. I, I've, I've you know, noticed him, you know, in 16 for the first time, he was kind of a newcomer, but um, I, I'd like him selfishly to join the Federalist party of America. Um, but uh, uh, which I'm involved with. Um, but, um, he seems to be like a really straight shooter. He's, he doesn't attack the president gratuitously, but I think, I think his objections with the Republican party go far beyond any objections he might have with, with the style of Donald Trump. He seems very disappointed that, that, um, Republicans have lost all spending discipline that, you know, the, the debt issue has gone out the window. We have made a lot of promises, um, you know, uh, you know, on, on foreign trade and, um, and tariffs, et cetera. And I think, you know, there are a lot of Republicans like Ben Sass, I happen to be one of them, um, that um, that thought that these things were fundamental to who, to who we are. And um, and they just seem to get washed away by populism, which, you know, which some people love. And there be some listeners that are that are huge fans of the administration. But the but the conservative tenants, the legs of the school got stool got swept away. You know, the foreign alliance is the rest of it. Um and so I think Sass is an honest voice out there in the wilderness. You know, he's young. He, you know, he, he, uh, he was, you know, some people tried to recruit him to run in 16. And he said, listen, I've got young kids. I'm not ready to do it. I haven't, I don't have enough experience in government or politics yet, but um, he's definitely someone to watch. I mean, there are others. And he's also, you know, he's somebody that serves in the Senate that has been critical, you know, where do of this administration, but has not walked away. He didn't retire like a lot of other people did. Like he's hung in there. So I think he's a really interesting guy and um, he tweets a lot. You know, you could tell he's doing it himself. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I tweet for a half dozen people that are in elective office and, um, and, you know, you could tell the difference between, you know, kind of a, a consultant driven, you know, generic tweet and the real stuff. And he's tweeting his own stuff. He's communicating with individual Americans, you know, in real time on any given day. I, I, I think he's an interesting guy. I keep an eye on him. He's got a good sense of humor. He doesn't take himself too seriously. I think it's going to be great for him to have Mitt Romney in the Senate by his side. You know, I saw Romney tweeted earlier today. 
basically his outrage at the fact that, you know, last year we spent $300 billion just on, on interest alone on the debt, which, you know, as we talked about with Joe Carpen a few weeks ago, it was $21 trillion in climbing. And there yeah. certainly are, are not enough Republicans uh, in Congress talking about what, uh, that. In fact, there are so few you can practically name them on one hand. Uh, so for Ben Sass to be able to get out, once we get through this midterm election, um, for him to get out front next year with Mitt Romney and maybe a couple of others, uh, it will be... Uh, it, I think it should make a difference, and it'd be it, it's he needs some he needs some fresh blood beside him there, because he does he, there's not he, there's not enough of it. He does, and that's the thing is that you've got to be in order to to take on that that you know gigantic that gi- gigantic uh, load of debt. You have to be willing to throw your political career away. I mean, you have to do two things from from my perspective. One, you have to communicate very succinctly with the American public in a very convincing way, in a way that has not been um, you know heretofore done. Uh, to explain why it's an absolute necessity to get the debt down and um, and to start, you know, restraining spending at the federal level. And the second thing you need to do is be willing to to pay for it with your job. Because um, if you're, I mean, if the, the, you're going to have to go into the third rails, you're going to have to grab the third rails and extend the, extend the, uh, you know, the age limits of, on Social Security and on, on some Medicaid, Medicare things. Um, it's, you know, it's radioactive. It pulls you know, 88 to 12 against you, but you still have to do it. And so I think you're right. I think a Sass might have the guts to do it. I think a Romney might, but there's got to be a few of them. If it's just one, it's not enough because everyone else is chicken and they'll run for the hills. But, they, you know, they need to have a sober conversation. I, I had hoped that it was going to be Paul Ryan doing it. And then I think history just moved in a different direction for Ryan. But, um, but you know, that's what it's going to take. And you know, Sass is a young guy who who might just have the intestinal fortitude to do that. We're gonna, you know, we'll find out. I, I hope it's he. Well, you know, if we if we believe that the the blue wave uh, is going to take over in the House, uh, then we're basically going to rely on the Senate because you're not seeing this kind of leadership from the White House. I'll tell you that. I mean, I, I I was counting on Trump to veto the spending bill, which he did, that omnibus bill, and then he said later on that he regretted it. But I don't think it was him going into 2020 that he's going to take on any of these entitlements. There's just no chance. So we're, it's going to have yeah, to and, in the Senate. Yeah, and 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 it's funny because to to Trump's fairness, he 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 promised not to. He told voters that he wouldn't do that, and that mm-hmm. kind of fell into that populist strain, where he said, "No, I'm not going to touch it." And um, you know, he didn't want to go there, and at least he was honest about it. There's so many, you know, ostensible conservatives that go out there that talk about this stuff and then do nothing when they when they get into office. But this is going to blow up on us. And, you know, Joe talked about it so well. Joe Carvin talked about it so well a couple of weeks ago with us. But, we, you know, those interest rates are, are moving up. And as the economy begins to turn along, I mean, it's going to fly. And interest rates don't tend to go up a basis point at the time. They they go up in chunks, you know, half a percent, a percent. Then suddenly you're at three, then you're at five, then you're at seven. And you could be looking, you know, realistically or semi-realistically at a trillion dollars in debt payments annually in just a few years. And that's, I mean, that's just bananas. I mean, that's 10, that's, you know, that's six, seven times the the budget of New York state in interest payments, um, you know, uh, annually. And that, you know, it freezes out investment. I mean, it's a real problem. And we need young, fresh, brave communicators to explain it to the public so that when the time comes to make these hard choices, you know, th- there's some understanding of, of why we have to do it or we just don't do it. Well, then- you know, if you, when you look at how active this um, younger generation of voters is on issues and not necessarily at the polls, but certainly um, be- between elections on you know, in- issues of immigration, um, uh, gun, uh, gun rights gun- and gun violence, uh, you, we got to figure out a way to get them engaged on this issue of the debt and the, and the financial security of this country. Uh, and for them, I don't know how, you know, they, they certainly understand what student loans mean and what student debt means. So I, maybe that's something that we can focus on too, as we go forward here, because it's, um, I think that, I mean, that, that, that could be a way for us to, to start making a difference because our generation somehow has let all of this happen. Yeah, it was something I was going to ask Ken because he's um, he's done a lot of financial writing. I remember he was writing for the Wall Street Journal and a few other publications. He was always publishing, uh, you know, kind of business pieces. And but I didn't want to keep him on because we had said, you know, get back to your family. But um, it's uh, it's a conversation that 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 needs to be had, but it's not even close to being to being discussed. You know, it was as we said with Simpson Bowles a few years ago, 
but it's not even in consideration. And you're right. If the Democrats take over the the House, um, you know, there goes that. But the Republicans, frankly, haven't been doing anything anyway. You know, I mean, those are my people, but they they uh, they just punted as soon as they got power. No, and I don't know. I mean, you're now you're. You, I'm not out campaigning with with anybody, and you are. And I, I wonder what what any of these candidates are talking about uh, when it comes to this to the federal budget. I know in New York, Molinaro was talking about the state budget, but do you think are, are members of Congress actually even addressing any of this stuff? Well, can they even get any traction? It's, is it just Trump twenty four seven that voters aren't even listening to issues like? Well, well, you know? well that raises well that raises a whole a whole uh, other point, which is really important. I think. For anybody running for any office in America right now, whether it's dog catcher or mayor or, you know, uh, you oh, know, those are alderman, like the same. Alderman, yeah. the same. It's all the same. You did all of those in one job. I remember same job. Same job. <laughs> when you were mayor. But but it, it's um it is very, very difficult in this environment to get any traction in any races. In 2016, I d- did a couple of congressional races and you just couldn't get press. I mean, you could get a story placed here or there. But you couldn't get any any momentum in a race because everything went to Trump in Washington, and Trump is so good at generating news. Obviously, that's been his genius for you know for forty years. That um, that you know once you you begin to get a public conversation going, whether you're outside of Phoenix or outside of Minneapolis or or in New York or Virginia, you could start to get a conversation going. But then the next day, it's a big national scandal issue. Not a scandal, but. Uh, can you believe what he said about Nike or about the NFL or about Amoroso or about you know Morning Joe? And all the attention shifts constantly. So it's very hard to build a narrative. I mean, that's what I do for a living and, and you've done, Liz, is build narratives for campaigns. The narrative is interrupted. It's like trying to read a book and you have to put it down every 12 seconds to go look at something on television. And it's hard to follow the storyline if you're a voter. And so it's a, it's it makes it very difficult. It makes it difficult. So – you know, campaigns have to figure out how to get around that. And maybe as you talked to me earlier about, it brings back the old fashioned things like knocking on doors and, you know, billboards and doors, you know, you know, those things work. Well, you know, incumbent, incumbents um, have, you know, has always had a huge advantage over challengers, but it's, it seems to me that it's even more so in, in this climate. It seems it's so hard to raise money when you're, when you're a, a first time candidate or, or um, a challenger. And to try to do it in a, when you can't even get a, an article in your own local paper about your race uh, or the first thing that you're asked is, well, where do you stand on Trump? It's a problem. It, and it's not, it's just not fair. It's, it's not fair to the good people who are running and it's do, doing a really, I think, a terrible, terrible um, disservice to the to the public. And and it, and it just kind of happens organically. I mean, it, it's like, you know, Ken talked about the, you know, the world, the digital world and the rest of it. And with the president and I'm not and. And I'm not even saying I'm not saying this to be critical, but he uses Twitter very effectively, though, you know, sometimes not so effectively. He knows how to make noise. I mean, he you know, and, and there's there's a tactic in that in politics that that Trump became very good at, where is, you know, you you stir it up and then you take advantage of it. You stir it up and you take advantage of it. You create chaos and then get something out of it. Move on to the next thing. And he's used it as a business tool for years. The problem is that there's nothing left for anybody else to talk about. And it's um, it's you know that that's a that's a it's you know you can't fix that because it's just happening in a real way. The news has to cover it because it's what people want to talk about. But um, you know, I talked about the Federalist Party before, which is kind of a localist party pushing issues down to the local level wherever possible. But it's hard to have those conversations when again you keep having to go look at Fox, CNN, and MSNBC to find out what's going on. You know. <laughs> Don't you think we've reached the place of complete national exhaustion, though? I, I yes or no. I, you know, it's interesting. You and I, before we got on the air, we were talking about John McCain's funeral, which was only eight days ago, and it, it seems like a century ago. Um, but for a moment, it seemed like the country paused and reflected on both his life and his legacy, but also, you know, what what he's meant to the country over the years. And in many, you know, at many times when he brought out the best in people, it both in politics and just, um, uh, you know, in in their communities. And th- that feel-good feeling, and also, I, I think, a little bit of a sense of shame. A lot of people looked around and thought, God, we've got to get back to this. You know, we've lost it here with all this hysteria and fighting and the name-calling. And, the, um, yeah. and it, it, by Tuesday morning, it was all over. It was like it never happened. It's like people never even... 
and and that that's actually scares me, and it's just, and it's it's sad. But I but and I think that was probably the longest news cycle that we've had for a long time. When you, yes, when you think about, I mean, think about the, sh- the shooting in Las Vegas. I mean, and I say that one because that one was just. It, I mean, they're all insane. They're all crazy shootings. But you had a guy that that set up with with a with you know he created an automatic we- weapon and opened up on a concert in shooting out of a out of a casino in Las Vegas and shot how many people and and I remember when that broke I thought I knew and we all knew it was going to be at best a two day story, at yeah. best. I mean, like nine eleven was like a six year story. You know, I mean, you know, we were both in New York that day and we, we were had some, you know, involvement with people that that were that were, you know, there and, and didn't make it. And after about three years, I was so sick of talking about 9-11. I couldn't bear it. Um, I mean, after about three weeks, I was tired of it, but it went on and on and on. And now you have a mass shooting and it's it's 24 hours sometimes. You know, it just, uh, or, you know, or lots of these news stories, you just know they're going to move along because something else is going to push it. Well, speaking of big news stories, we've got a massive hurricane hitting the coast, and I hope for all of our listeners who are down in the Carolinas, you're going to be safe and um, and evacuate or do what you need to do, because it's um, it's suddenly it's really, it's right, we're staring right at it. That's right, that's right. And and, and also a happy a happy New Year to our, uh, any Jewish brethren listening. And um, and uh, yes, stay, stay out of the storm. And thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. He made me proud, not good. Yes, he did. Heavy brotherhood from sea.